This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Help others discover UCTV podcasts by leaving a comment or rating for us in iTunes. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Uh, what I would like to do today is really take you on my magic carpet. We're going to go through a lot of terrain. I've, I've got about 82 slides, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I'm going to go across this terrain, which is fairly complex. It goes from philosophy, it goes to neuroscience, it goes to psychology, and of course, we will not be remiss if we do not touch on politics as well. And I'm not a shy retiring war flower, so I will mention most of the uh, key issues. Um, before I start, I would like to mention a couple of people that I've been working with. And these have really been uh, uh, my main uh, supporters in particularly this project here. One of them is uh, Ray Valle. Uh, we published a paper this week uh, developing uh, Alzheimer's dementia prevalence for Latinos. Uh, it's a real uh, new technique, a new algorithm that we applied for San Diego County. And the other one is that we're developing uh, a paper that criticizes the new dementia guidelines. It's a very methodological paper, it's a very technical paper, and we hope to get that published by the end of the year. Uh, the other people uh, that I've worked with are uh, Patricia uh, Mostella, if she's here, can you please stand up? Uh, Cindy Olsen, Erin Williams. Uh, two of the other people there, Erin Williams and Haley Chung, uh, they are my graduate students. They've been working diligently on this. Uh, Haley is working on the effect of uh, brain fitness on people who suffered trauma to the brain, concussion. And she's coming up with some really interesting findings, the difference between male and female in concussion. So uh, these are the people that I stand upon, uh, which is why I am in front of you today. Um, and I would like to cover, as I said, a very broad uh, topics. I would like to start off with there's a revolution here in science, and it's happening right here in dementia. And that's how I would like to start this uh, discussion today. And then I would like to focus on dementia errors. Dementia errors are when things happen that researchers do not like. You know, this, this statistic, the, the significance becomes a little bit diluted. But in fact, what we find in history is that these are not errors. This is a reality. You know, and sometimes we try and ignore them, we try and minimize them, we try and diminish them. And if you've read any papers, and I will mention a couple of them, particularly one uh, by David Snowden and the Nun study, I will mention him, I will introduce the study. And if you read those papers, they are, uh, there's a palpable earnestness to try and find a reason. And you are colluding with the researcher. All of us here would like a simple solution. But there isn't one. And that is the dementia areas. I would like to highlight some, uh, some issues there. And the last one is uh, the social interaction. That uh, the thesis, the premise, the final objective of this is 
Social interaction is important. We discount it. And yet it should be the focus, not just for dementia, but in terms of how we deal with patients. So you can see my magic carpet will cover a lot of terrain. Uh, some of you might fall off. Bye. <laughs> stay on, stay on. It's going to be a ride. So we start off. My story starts off a couple of years ago when the NIA, National Institute on Aging, one of the institutes at the National Institutes of Health, with the Alzheimer's Association, published new guidelines. And I saw these when they came out. I didn't think anything of them. I thought, this is good. They are trying to consolidate research. And then I was at a conference, and a guy called Al Rodbell came up to me, and he said, um, what do you think of the new guidelines? I thought, yeah, they're, they're OK. I think it will give us a good direction for research. He said, yeah, he said, but everyone with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, now is demented. I said, no, they won't use it like that. It's mainly guidelines. They're not rules. They're mainly guidelines. Then what happened this year, uh, I started teaching social workers. And social workers are a new breed. I'm a psychologist. And uh, I've been teaching psychology for over 30 years. So this was a, a, a change for me. Social workers are really practical people. They're a bit like my children. They say, so what? What about me? How can I use this? So it's very difficult uh, sometimes to discuss concepts like guidelines uh, when the direct implications are linear. So, I went back into it, and I found that perhaps there is an issue with what Al Rodbell has said. The guidelines come under four papers. There's one that introduces the uh, guidelines. There's one, and these are all online, uh, accessible. There's a, a preclinical, which I will explain in a minute. There's an MCI, and there's Alzheimer's. And with these four papers, what you have, ex first of all, they're excellently written. They're very uh, good papers. Some of uh, people here at uh, UCSD were involved. Perhaps your colleagues were involved in these. Uh, no gerontologist was involved in the production of these papers. But they are extremely well laid out, well written, well argued. And what they argue and sorry, yeah, the last one is autopsies, how to define um, uh, dementia in autopsies. And what they have done is they have said, because of all the new development in biomarkers, uh, these are uh, markers in the body that are really not due to the disease, but really indicate that there is something happening in the brain. For example, one of them would be shrinkage in certain parts of the brain. And now by volumetric functional MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, we can identify this re at, at, at a very early stage. So what it does, it says, listen, there's a preclinical stage here. In the preclinical stage, there are no symptoms. You have no symptoms. This is the, the first stage of the disease. And then what you get after the preclinical, you start getting mild cognitive impairment. A mild cognitive impairment is when you start losing uh, or, or, or forgetting names, uh, but it doesn't, I know, I know. And so mild cognitive impairment is when you start forgetting names, nouns, you start forgetting things, but it doesn't really affect your activities of daily living. Then from MCI, you get early dementia, and of course, uh, lay dementia, which ultimately leads to death. There's no happy story in dementia. Have you noticed that? There's no happy story. So what the guidelines tell us is this, that there's a big population that is a preclinical. From that preclinical population, we have a larger uh, or a, a smaller population that suffers from mild <coughs> cognitive impairment. Uh, 
And then when it progresses, it progresses into dementia. It's very linear and it's very mechanistic and somehow it is comforting. You feel, yes, it is linear, we can do something about this. And this is where the revolution is. We have moved away from Cartesian science. We have moved away from the mechanical science. And mechanical science, Cartesian science says, if I understand parts of the puzzle, I can understand the whole puzzle. But when I was growing up, and I went to university in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, 53, 53, sometimes I age myself. We went, we talked about postmodernism. Welcome. Postmodernism is where we said, listen, it's not just about the mechanics. People, individuals, influence what happens. And the, the heroes here are Heidegger, are Sartre, but in my, in my field, in psychology, it was Berger and Luckman and the social creation of reality. And it opened my mind. It told me that reality does not exist outside of me. I bring it inside me and I create it. I interact with reality. And this is postmodernism. You will notice that at the end here, we have the American philosophy. And the American philosophy is really the egoistic individual, the objectivism. And that's the revolution. We're going back in time. The example I use, what, what does it mean? Again, my social work students. You know, my, I have a little devil on the left, uh, which is the dark one, and the light one. You know, saying, go on, do it. And the other said, don't do it, don't do it. And my social work students on the right going, yeah, so what? What does it mean? What does it explain? How can I use it? So I say, well, it's about like Newton physics. You know, with Newtonian physics, we can go to the moon. We do not need quantum mechanics to go to the moon. We can go to the moon with Newtonian physics. We can even go to Mars with Newtonian physics. But it doesn't explain everything. It doesn't explain everything. One of the, uh, the examples I use is that light. Light is both, both a particle so, for example, if you have clothes that are being hit by sunlight, they get dimmed. And also, it's a wave. It goes through water, for example. And this is the post-modernist uh, philosophy. When it comes to biology, we have moved away from biological determinism. And we're talking about neurogenesis now. We're talking about how your experiences affect the, how your genes are expressed. As a gerontologist, I've done a lot of literature review in this. There's a lot of studies coming up telling us that your behavior determines how your genes are expressed. And this is postmodernism. This is where we should be going. This is really the frontier of science. This is the revolution in science. But the guidelines, what they do, is they negate this. They negate it. It's linear, it's mechanical. And I hope that I can at least chip away at that marble edifice that they have set up with some of the current research that is coming in. And it is true. This is a, a blog that I write. I have over 85 papers. If you don't want to buy the book, it's free. I'm not a very good salesman, am I? No, I know. I should have brought books up here and sold them, but you can have it for free. It's online. And the, one of the articles that I wrote is that with this, we're all becoming demented. We're all demented, just it has not expressed itself. I am at fault here. Not only do I have preclinical uh, 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 biomarkers, because I've had multiple concussions as a kid, I've played soccer, I've fell, I've got, if you can see, cuts everywhere on my head. I forget all the time. 
selective amnesia sometimes. <laughs> so, is it true that we're all becoming demented? I have spoken, I have a couple of friends who are in their hundreds. Statistically, they should all have dementia. One of them is uh, Laura Simon. She went blind. She remembers all the telephone numbers by heart. You know, she, they, she has learned how to cope with some of her limitations. These are not people who are demented. These are people who are very together, very in control. She's 105. So is this true? Is it true that once you start getting the neuropathology, the disease, then it's just a simple matter of time to get mild cognitive impairment and then to get dementia. So where are the errors? First of all, it's interesting to note that there are 308 neurological diseases. So even if you have the neuropathology, we do not know which one it will be expressed in. There is no study that looks at the inception of that neuropathology and it follows that person or that disease through to identify exactly which neurological disease it uh, will express itself as. So that's the first one. There's a lot of diseases. There's a lot of neurological diseases. It's a little bit like saying that uh, uh, politicians, because they are uh, university educated, that means that all university educated pe people turn into politicians. The syllogism is wrong. The second one, the second argument here, is that if you look at 25 year olds, Brack and Brack, who are famous for defining stages in neuropathology, when they looked at the autopsies of 25 year olds, they found that a fifth of these people, these uh, corpses, they had uh, neuropathology. So neuropathology, the disease, is quite prevalent. First of all, it's indistinct in terms that there are multiple diseases that the neuropathology can be expressed as. And the second one is a lot of people have this neuropathology. They live with it uh, successfully. And the third argument is, again, the, the Snowden report comes from a NUN study. The NUN study started at the University of Minnesota. It's about uh, 698 nuns. And they said, study us. You know, they are quite a, a homogeneous population. They drink for very little. They are, perhaps do not go to parties, as many of us do. Uh, yeah. Uh, they have a, a restricted diet, and so they're, they're a homogeneous group, and they said, look at us, investigate, uh, and, and then when we die, you are very welcome to look, look at our brain. And then after the autopsy, what they did is they checked to see, the, to correlate how bad or, or the condition of their brain with their behavior. This was a, a really good study. It was taken over by University of Kentucky when Snowden moved there, and now it moved back in his retirement, moved back to the University of Minnesota. And what we do find is, this is a technical um, graph, and what, what I want you to look at is this one. Here, it is the relationship be between cognitive state and the uh, stage of Alzheimer's pathology. Okay? And what this says if, is that if, the, if there's neuropathology, then it correlates half the time with your cognitive state. So it's a 50-50. But once you eliminate those with memory problems, once you just select those with the, 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 where their memory is intact, the correlation diminishes and the significance disappears. Very strange. So, with dementia, we have a problem that there's a lot of neurological diseases here. Dementia is just one of them. 
Second one is that there's a lot of neuropathology amongst us. I guarantee half of us here have stage two, stage three neuropathology. I for sure have it because I had a lot of head trauma as a kid. And the third one is that the correlation is not perfect with the neuropathology and the expression of the disease. Okay, so there are questions about dementia. What about MCI? If you look at some of the etiology, some of the causes of MCI, you will find that there are some similarities between uh, the causes of dementia and the causes of MCI. But this is not the whole story. The whole story is that there are some over-the-counter medications that can cause mild cognitive impairment. There's also transient global amnesia. This happens uh, without warning. Uh, there's no indication, there's no neuropathology related to it, and it tends to go away without any residue, without any effect. Also, we know that alcoholism, recreational drug use, and anyone who's been through some stress, I'm sure none of you have, <laughs> you go through MCI. I was going through divorce eight years ago, and I, I forget things, you know. I, I, I put my keys in the fridge, you know, I put the milk in the car. Uh, and that happens, and it goes away. It's not neurologically uh, based, or rather pathologically based. It's just that uh, you're going through a very stressful period in life. So the MCI, the etiology, is uh, very different in some cases, can be, from dementia. And the last one is to do with the, um, how accurate MCI is. I will show papers up here. These are ac academic papers that have been published. You're very welcome uh, for, uh, to have a copy of the slides. Anything that I say is referenced. Please email me. I will send you the PowerPoints. I'll send you the papers if, uh, if you're interested. This is a paper looking at uh, classification criteria for MCI. And you would think that this will give us some indication of how to define MCI. And what they do is they compare it with what is known as age-associated cognitive decline. And age-associated cognitive de decline is related primarily to speed. Our brains, part of our the structure in our brains, shrink. You know, it shrinks about 1% a year, certain parts of your brain. Other parts uh, do not shrink so much. And I'll show you studies where, in fact, uh, part of the brain grew. So it's not as rigid as we think it is. But with age-associated cognitive decline, what we find is that it's fairly prevalent in the population. Of course, because everyone who's aging will have aging-associated cognitive decline. So about one in five of the population will have this. And uh, in comparison, only 3%, 3 percent, three in 100 will have MCI. The strange part of this study, or the unique part, the errors, is that only 11%, one in 10, of MCI converts to dementia. Whereas in fact, age-associated cognitive decline, about a quarter, more than a quarter of them, translate and convert to dementia. So if I had to use a guide, instead of using MCI, which is very ill-defined, I will use age-associated cognitive decline instead. Okay, so that's MCI. So we have an issue with uh, the neuropathology. We have an issue with uh, MCI. What about with dementia? <coughs> I love reading anything by Snowden. He's got a book uh, called Aging with Grace. Brilliant book, if you can find it. <clears throat> and Grace is one of the nuns as well. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's a clever book. And as I said, the, what you get from it is palpable. The guy Snowden really wants to find 
a solution, wants to find an answer to all these questions. And in this paper here, he has a little graph hidden in a little corner. And the first time I read the paper, I said, yeah, okay, error margins. And then I came back to it some years later. And I said, that wasn't even a title. That wasn't even a title. And I stood, stood still for a bit, and I tried to understand it. This is what it said. These are neuropathologies here, the level of disease in the brain. So 5, 6 is extreme disease in the brain. And this is memory impairment. And what you find is that for 8% that had severe neuropathology, they did not have uh, memory impairment. So 8%, they had the disease, but they did not have the memory impairment. Now, anyone who knows statistics, 8% is a significant percentage. And I thought, wait a minute, this is, this is big, because if there's 8% error margins, anything that has been published on dementia is wrong. This is also interesting. If you have moderate, then you have about 32%, where you do not show any expression. I thought, this is interesting. 32% do not express the disease, even though they have the neuropathology. In the literature, we find that the range is between 19 to 67 percent. And this is a large error margin. This is a large error margin. When you are saying that around half of the people have some level of neuropathology, but they do not express it, then that's a big question mark. And if we look at further studies, people might say, well, they might translate, they might have MCI, and then the older you get, the MCI gets translated to dementia. It's another paper here, and that's what they looked at. And look at the gray. What you find is that MCI does, in fact, re reduce, diminish with the greater neuropathology, but Alzheimer's increases. So there is perhaps some balancing act here. But if you look at the total, there's still about 10% that have perfect memory. Another study that looked at exactly this issue, they looked at uh, dementia. These are all people with uh, the neuropathology criteria for Alzheimer's. So if you just see the autopsy, you say that person has dementia. And then when you go back, you find that only about only 60%, which is quite a large number, but it is, there's a large error margin here. It is not significant. You have some with global impairments, meaning that they have multiple uh, deficits. There are some, about 25%, uh, that have mild cognitive impairment. And look at this exception there, the exceptional people. So no, they haven't killed postmodernism. Sorry, the guidelines have not done that. There is something there. And the issue with reality is it doesn't go away. It keeps coming up. Snowden, uh, one of my favorite uh, authors in this area, he did actually say, we cannot explain this. He said, there's something else that is happening. And he came up with neuroplasticity. He said that there is a pathology. We know about this. We have twin studies where we look at twins that are very similar, in, uh, especially monozygotic twins. They share the same egg. They have very similar uh, genetic makeup. And we can look at uh, gene markers. And that tells us that there is a very strong both a genetic and a biological determined factor in dementia. There is. But there is also another uh, area of expression here, which is to do with neuroplasticity. 
and education. Actually, Snowden mentions neuroplasticity and education. Now we'll talk about neurogenesis. And neurogenesis, it's a much more accurate uh, term because it shows that genesis meaning birth and neuro meaning neurons. It's giving birth to neurons. And that's exactly what is happening. Uh, neurogenesis or neuroplasticity is the brain's lifelong capacity to modify its structural and functional architecture in response to challenges and experiences. And there's a couple of uh, seminal uh, researchers in this. Uh, Deutsch is the guy that wrote The Brain That Changes Itself. It's a very popular book. It really made neuro neuroplasticity very popular. This is nothing new. I'm glad to see that we have some Asian and Japanese uh, audience here, uh, people in the audience. And the Japanese have a term for this. They call it kuroi. Is that correct? Thank you. I was t and it's, in fact, a translation of hardship and labor. And what this is is that if you uh, challenge your brain, the brain will come up with a solution. I love Jean Piaget's definition here, and he's redeemed a little bit, because when I was at uh, college, Jean Piaget said, well, the brain crystallizes when you're about 18. And then it is purely a process of attrition from there on. And we swallowed it. As a psychologist, I swallowed that. You know, old age is purely attrition. So I, I redeem him here by putting him in here because I think his definition of intelligence is very clever. It says that it's what you use when you do not know what to do. So with dementia errors, I, I'm going to uh, tell you two, uh, talk about two studies very briefly. And one of them involved London taxi drivers. Uh, London taxi drivers, what they have to do for 34 months, they have to learn the knowledge. And the knowledge is 25,000 streets, 320 routes around London. And they have to know them by heart. And you see the knowledge boys, now they're also knowledge girls, in their little scooter. They wear a bright vest and they have a little uh, clip-on at the front. And they are learning the knowledge. It's 34 months, very intense. And what they did is they, and most of them are uh, mature adults. They're between 35 and 45. And what they did is they compared them with uh, bus drivers. So both of them are driving. One of them is learning, is challenging themselves, the other one are going on a set route in London. And what they found is amazing. When they compared bus drivers with taxi drivers, taxi drivers had greater gray matter volume in parts of their brain. The brain plasticity works, neurogenesis works. When you challenge uh, the brain, the brain will develop neurons to address that challenge. There is a negative part to this, and I'll just put it up here, and I'll uh, talk when I, we express my study, when we talk about my study. And what it shows here is that the ability to acquire new visual spatial information was worse in taxi drivers. So there is a negative to this. I'll come back to this later on. The other study that talks about uh, neurogenesis in a different way is by um, a number of researchers, uh, Vergese being one of them, and it looks at leisure activities and the risk of dementia among the elderly. And what they found is th that among all the leisure activities, reading, playing board games, playing musical instruments, and dancing, were associated most with reduced risk of dementia. And out of these, dancing and musical instruments were 
the best uh, in protecting you from dementia. And again, the reason is because especially uh, if you dance with some of the women I have danced, you do not know what's happening. You're in total loss. You do not know what you're doing, and you're trying to look cool. So it's fairly, fairly traumatic. No? And that's when your brain is challenged. You have to challenge your brain. If you do word uh, puzzles and crossword puzzles, you're not challenging yourself if you're very good at it. You have to find things that you're not comfortable in. Remember the Kuroi. Uh, you have to find something that's a little bit hardship. I do this in my teaching, and I always push my students. And uh, yesterday I was teaching a class in statistics, and one of my students was crying. And I thought, perhaps I pushed too, lo too far this time. Uh, but most of the other students said this was really the best, best class. And what I did, because they think they are good at statistics, I gave them a bad database to play with. You know, oh, I know, I know, I know. I, I feel really bad, which is why I'm trying to re resolve this by confessing to you. <laughs> so, in effect, what we have is not distinct parameters and not distinct group, groupings where preclinical is distinct where then MCI is completely within preclinical and dementia is completely within MCI. That is not the reality. The reality is a little bit more fuzzy, a little bit more diffuse. We have dementia up there with a little bit without any preclinical. It's very gray. It might or might not be the, uh, MCI. There's part of MCI that is perhaps not, doesn't show any neuropathology. And we have these people, strange and wonderful people, that have the neuropathology and do not express it. And as uh, one of my professors at the London School of Economics said, we like studying weird people, because that's where the money is. So who are these weird people? This is our study. I have to commend uh, Pat Mostele for this. I, I'm a full professor. I teach at uh, San Diego State University. I have a full load. I also have two kids. I also have things to do. So when Pat came to me and said, I'm really interested in this, I said, great, I'll give you a room. Knock yourself out, kid. <laughs> and she stayed. She did a sabbatical with us. And she persuaded me. She said, listen, there's a lot of programs out, out there. And this one, Posit Science, Brain Fitness, it seems to be the best. Everyone seems to copy them. And best of all, there are uh, random control trials here that show the efficacy of this. And what she did is that she got community colleges involved or interested in this uh, package. The program itself has five different types, five different activities, and the only one that I remember, because I try to cheat, I always try to cheat, my kids do not even play cards with me anymore. <laughs> I was looking at the tone, and the tones go something like this, pa, 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 and you have to tell if it's going up or it's going down. I said, hey, this is easy, yeah? I can jump 15 classes, 10 classes. And I went, I jumped five classes, and I went, Pip. I went, Pip. and it's amazing. And I look at uh, the students, and they can identify this. The only way that you can explain this is that the brain is accommodating this new stimuli. It's accommodating it. It's making synaptic transmissions, so you're much more sophisticated at differentiating. And there's five different areas here. Uh, the community colleges, they did this uh, for free when we uh, applied to the National Institutes of, uh, Institutes of, on, of Health, uh, NIA, uh, for this. Uh, the first line in my proposal was, this is not a clinical trial. And it was rejected because it was not a clinical trial. They do not like the fuzziness of the study. We were interested 
primarily in ethnic groups. There has never been a study looking at ethnicity and brain fitness, cognitive uh, intervention. So we wanted to be the first. So we went ahead and did it anyway. Or rather, Pat Mostella and her merry men and women did it, and I collected the questionnaires which my graduate assistants number crunched. Initially, we were hoping to do a very technical group, uh, which is known as a switching replication study. And this is where you have a pre-examination. One group goes to brain fitness. Another gr group goes to the control. Then another observation here. We give them questionnaires. And then they switch sides. So we'll see what happens. This is a really good methodology. And that's uh, uh, the way that it was set up. But in fact, what happened was very simple. They came in, they, we did a pre, they did the brain fitness, and we did a post. Right now, we have about 100, um, I will report to you the pilot result from 180 participants. We have over 250. So hopefully by the end of summer, when the graduate students uh, uh, finish uh, inputting the data, we'll have the real results. What I want to share with you is some of the preliminary results, which I think are very interesting. Some of the pre and the post questionnaires that we used. So we had a health survey, we had a mini mental uh, state examination, we had the Weschler test of adult reading, uh, the cognitive self-report questionnaire is what posit science uses, and they have a cognitive part, a social part, and a failure part. And the other one is a cognitive failure questionnaire. This is uh, failures, uh, mistakes that you have made. Uh, all self-report, absent-mindedness, all self-reported. So, who were the group? The group, and we have some of them here, uh, so if you're interested in talking, to some who went through the group, they are here. Uh, most of them are uh, married, a uh, large proportion are widowed. Uh, ethnicity, we have, um, of course, as you would expect, a uh, large proportion white, seven out of 10. But we also have a lot of Latinos, 12% are Latino population. Let's look at the results. And to make it simple, what I looked at is those that have declined at the post, those that have stayed the same, and those that have improved. The first one is the Wishler. And what you see there is that you have a 56% improvement. And this is dramatic. If I had a drug that did this, I would not be here in front of you today. <laughs> I don't know if that's good for you or bad for you. <laughs> Across the board, there were improvements. Across all the studies, all the questionnaires, all the uh, designs, there were improvements. And even this, where there's no change, with our population, that is a win-win. That's a win-win. So if you look at it, this is incredible. So we have the WITAR, we have the uh, failure test, and look at the mini-mental. Look at the mini-mental. A great improvement, 52%. If we look at the cognitive uh, self-report questionnaire, this is overall, again, great improvement. In cognition is 24, in social is 24, and in hearing it is 27%. Out of all these, the smallest one was the cognitive, 24%. So I said, let's try and explain that. And I'm going to go through very briefly what I did with this. This is the data that I'm trying to explain, the variance. I'm saying the question is, who improved and why? And I have four models here. These are regression models, and I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, but I'm going to highlight some things for discussion. And these are purely pilot at this stage. Uh, the real results will be published when we 
have met all the power estimates. We need about 250. We have 180 at this stage. So the first one is demographic. Is age an issue? Is gender an issue? Is being married, does it help you or it, or it doesn't? And my main uh, uh, interest here is ethnicity. Is being of a certain ethnic class, ethnic group, does it improve your chances of improving? The other one is education. This might be something that you're really interested in, and the result will be surprising. The other one is well-being. Being happy or unhappy, having a concussion, being bored. Does it in somehow contribute to improving in your uh, post-test, in your cognitive uh, capacity? And the final one is pain. Level of pain that you have, and does it interfere? So these are the models. And what I'm going to show you is some regression analysis. Please do not uh, worry about this. I will just explain the main highlights. This is the significance, and this is how uh, uh, much it affected the dependent variable, which is the cognitive failure. And what you find is a couple of significance here. Age becomes a significant. The older you are, the more improvement you see. Very strange. The other one, significance, is widowed. That being widowed tends to promote the uh, dependent variable. You get better at it if you are widowed. And that's a, sorry? Everyone's going, yeah. And her husband's looking at her. There's an explanation here. This is the first model. The second model, which runs the same uh, variables, but then includes higher education. Still showing a lack of significance, but the direction is the way that we identified, we predicted. The higher the, your education, the lower the improvement. The lower your education, the more that you improve. <coughs> Remember that taxi driver study and there's a reason for it. The third model, again, age comes in, and if we look at health, it becomes a very significant determinant to how well you improve. So stay healthy. The brain, like any organ, uh, improves if you look after your body. And the fourth model that looked at pain brought in very little significance here. So, the take home from this is fairly straightforward. The first one is if you look at this number here, what that tells us is that we're explaining about 40% of the variance of people improving. And so we're explaining who improves. 40%. We can predict on the basis of some of these characteristics who will improve. And it also tells us that the age is a factor, that health is a primary factor, that education is negatively correlated, that having high education, you tend not to do so well in these tests. So where is the social interaction here? And what I would like to do is really to wrap it all up. My magic carpet is still going, and I'm trying to land it here. And I'm trying to land it on three things. One is that happiness and dementia. I would like to talk a little bit about dementia phobia and then finish off with equity. Happiness and dementia. When I spoke with uh, Patricia about this program, she told me this is an amazing program. Everyone is so happy. Oh, she said people were going to their physician and the physician was, wanted to know what they were doing, because they're improving. People were improving in their auditory capacity. People were improving in how, what they see, how they see, how they listen, how they communicate. I thought, my God, I don't believe Pat. I don't believe her. I cannot be this good. So I went to see them. I went in, and I asked all the students there about their experience. And it is amazing. Everyone felt good about doing this. Everyone felt good. And this 
really reports other uh, clinical trial studies using this, uh, this uh, brain fitness report the same thing. And what is surprising if I look at, when I look at other cognitive interventions, what we find is that, in fact, there is, in half the cases, there's an improvement. That in half the cases, there's subjective measures of memory, quality of life, or mood is improved. This is incredible. This is highly significant. Again, if we have a pharmacy, a pharmacological agent that does this, it be a, we, I'll, I'll be driving a nicer car. <laughs> Even with uh, Alzheimer's patients, not just with uh, MCI, mild cognitive impairment, if you also use uh, cognitive and motor intervention with some uh, medication, they showed also additional mood and cognitive benefits. At the end, what are we after? I know all of us want the silver bullet. We all want the panacea. We want to cure dementia. We want that. But we know it's complicated. We know that it's involved. And it's likely it will not happen in our lifetime. What is the ultimate expression of life? What is the ultimate expression? For me, being happy is one of them. So when these studies talk about quality of life, I'm interested. But it's in a review, in a very comprehensive review, what they found is that quality of life instruments are seldom used. And I think we need to address that. We need to address what works in making that individual happy. If it's about patient-centered, not about pharmacologically or research-centered, moi, it's about the person. A lot of patients and their caregivers tell me that people stop hugging me. You know, and they feel it. It is, we have to be very concerned about the quality of life of people suffering from dementia. The other issue that I want to highlight is dementia phobia. So these guidelines say that if you have MCI, you have the beginning of dementia. Heck, I'm worried, especially me. I write down where I park my car. That's how bad I am. So if I was a rich man, I would not go for prognosis here to my physician because dementia is a reportable disease. I'll go to Tijuana. Yeah? I'll go to Tijuana. If it's dangerous, I'll tell no one. I'll make sure, I'll make sure I do not lose my license, that I still have uh, control over my estate. And this is the reality. A friend of mine um, went to Tijuana because his back hurts. And the guy is a physician. I said, why did you do that? He said, well, he said, I owe a lot of money. And if they find that I have cancer, uh, I will lose my credit rating. People know this. People understand this. And there's a real issue with dementia phobia. A couple of years ago, at the same time that the guidelines were published, MetLife produced this report. What they found is that Alzheimer's is the second most fright frightened disease. People are more frightened of Alzheimer's than anything else, second to cancer. A majority of those di did not know anything about the disease, 62%. Uh, nearly a quarter of them uh, have uh, uh, predict that they will provide assistance to someone with Alzheimer's. And fewer than half of the uh, adults talked to family members about this. There's a phobia about dementia, and these guidelines do not help. They give no uh, options for improvement. There's no options for dealing with the disease. And the final one is equity. This is a paper that uh, is being published this week, uh, Population Aging, with uh, Ray Valle and Roberto Velasquez. And what we looked at is the prevalence of dementia among 
uh, Latinos in San Diego and Imperial County. And what we find mainly driven by demographics is that the Latino population, uh, dementia uh, population will increase by 100%, whereas for the white population only by uh, ten, uh, 10 times, 1,000%, 100 times, and um, nearly double for the white. We would love to do this with Asian population. There's cultural issues with uh, mental health. My area of expertise is American Indians, where the Indian Health Service does not even record dementia, and it is not part of the ICD code for their records. You cannot define dementia in the Indian Health Service. So, and the issue is not just the patients, it's also the caregivers. Look at this, what we expect to find among the Latino population in San Diego and Imperial County. So, my take home is that there is, there are individual variability in dementia. That there is a post-modernist movement here. Who you are, what you do, determines the expression of the disease. You are not passive agents. The second one is the meaning of life. What should be important? Is it that we find uh, medication, find a pill, find a panacea, a silver bullet, or that the loved one is happy? Do I make sure that they are happy? The third one is that we need to address inequity because if we find something that works and it's not accessible to people, then that new advancement might as well not exist. The social interaction is important whether you are demented or not. We are social creatures and society is important for us. Okay, thank you.